Well, the first question always is, can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me in the back? Hmm? Close as possible. How's that? Can you hear me in the back? Still not. Dude, you're killing me. I'm sorry. Oh, should I use that? Uh, how, how's this? Any different? How's that? Okay. Well, I'll try to not eat it. Uh, okay. This people can't see. This is. Yeah, you're both on. Okay. You're good. Well, it's uh, it's a little hard to talk at a give a talk in a Howard Zinn memorial lecture uh, at a Occupy meeting. Uh, there's mixed feelings necessarily go along with it. Uh, hmm? Closer. Uh, first of all, regret that uh, Howard's not here to take part in and uh, invigorate in his inimitable way uh, something that would have been the dream of his life. Uh, Secondly, uh, excitement that uh, the dream's actually being fulfilled. It's, it's a dream that, uh, for which he gave, he, he laid a lot of the groundwork. As I said, it would have been uh, a fulfillment of a dream for him to have uh, been here uh, with you. And it is a, a, a very exciting development. Okay. Well, why don't you take this? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> well, the, it is an extremely exciting development. In fact, uh, uh, it's kind of spectacular and, uh, and unprecedented. There's never been anything like it that I can think of. If the bonds and associations that are being established in these uh, remarkable events can be sustained uh, through a long, hard period ahead, because victories don't come quickly, it could turn out to be a, a really historic, uh, a, 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 a very significant moment in American history. Uh, the fact that the demonstrations are unprecedented, the Occupy movement is unprecedented, is quite appropriate to uh, uh, the, it's an unprecedented era, uh, not just this moment, but uh, actually since the 1970s. In the 1970s, there was uh, began a major turning point in American history. Uh, uh, since the uh, for centuries, since the uh, country began, it uh, uh, had been a developing society. And not in very pretty ways, that's another story, but uh, it was a developing society with uh, ups and downs, but uh, the general uh, progress towards uh, wealth, uh, industrialization, development, uh, 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 even in dark and hope, there was a lot of a pretty near constant uh, expectation that it's going to go on like this. Uh, that was true even in very dark times. I'm just old enough to remember the Great Depression. And uh, after the first few years, by the mid-30s, uh, although the situation was objectively uh, much harsher than it is today, uh, nevertheless, the spirit was quite different. There was a sense that we're going to get out of it, uh, even among unemployed people, like a lot of my relatives, that... Uh, uh, It'll get better. There's this. There's a militant labor movement organizing, CIO organizing was going on. It was getting to the point of uh, sit-down strikes, which really are very frightening to the business world. You could see it in the business press at the time, and because a sit-down strike is just a, a step before taking over the factory and running it yourself, and. Uh, something which incidentally is very much on the agenda today and we should keep in mind, I'll come back to it. Uh, also the New Deal legislations were beginning to come under popular pressure. 
uh, and there just was a sense somehow we're going to get out of it. It's quite different now. Uh, now there's a kind of pervasive sense of uh, hopelessness, sometimes despair. I think it's quite new in American history, and it has an objective basis. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, unemployed working people could anticipate realistically that the jobs are going to come back. Uh, if you're a worker in manufacturing today and the level of unemployment in manufacturing is approximately like the Depression, uh, if current tendencies persist, that's not, those jobs aren't going to come back. Uh, it's, uh, the change took place in the 70s. Uh, a lot of reasons for it. Uh, uh, one of the underlying reasons uh, discussed mainly by... Uh, Economic historian Robert Brenner has done a lot of work on it. it. Is the falling rate of profit? There were other factors. It led to major changes in the economy. Uh, a reversal of the several hundred years of progress towards industrialization and development, and turn to a process of deindustrialization and de-development. Of course, manufacturing production continued, but overseas. Uh, very profitable, but uh, no good for the workforce. And uh, uh, along with that came uh, a, a, sh a significant shift of the economy from productive enterprise, producing things people need or can use, uh, to uh, financial manipulation. Uh, f financialization of the economy really took off at that time. Before the uh, before the seventies, banks were banks. They did what banks are supposed to do in a state capitalist economy, take unused funds like, say, your bank account and transfer it to some uh, potentially useful purpose, like uh, buying a home, or sending a kid to college, or whatever it might be. That changed radically. In this, and then suddenly there were no financial crises. Uh, it was a period of enormous growth, the highest growth in American history, uh, maybe in economic history, sustained growth through the 50s and the 60s, and it was egalitarian. Uh, so the lowest quintile did about as well as the highest quintile. A lot of people moved into uh, reasonable lifestyles, what's called here middle class, working class it's called in other countries. Uh, but they, uh, uh, that was real. And uh, uh, the 60s uh, accelerated it. The activism in the 60s after a pretty dismal decade uh, really civilized the country in lots of ways that are uh, permanent. They're not, they're not changing. They're staying on. Uh, 70s came along, sudden sharp change, uh, deindustrialization, offshoring of production, uh, shifting to financial institutions, which grew enormously. Uh, also, in, uh, uh, I should say that in the 50s and the 60s, there was also the development of what several decades later became the uh, high-tech economy, uh, computers, uh, internet, uh, IT revolution, mostly developed in the 50s and the 60s, uh, substantially in the state sector. It took a couple of decades before it took off, but it was developed there. Uh, the, the 1970s, the developments that took place, set off a, a kind of a vicious cycle it led to uh, concentration, concentration of wealth increasingly in the hands of uh, the financial sector, which uh, doesn't benefit the economy, probably harms it and the society. But it did lead to tremendous concentration of wealth, substantially there. Uh, concentration of wealth yields concentration of political power, which in turn gives rise to legislation that increases that accelerates the cycle of uh, fiscal policies, tax changes, uh, rules of corporate governance, uh, deregulation, uh, essentially bipartisan. Alongside of this came a, began the very sharp rise in uh, uh, costs of elections, which drives the, uh, the political parties even deeper than before into the pockets of the corporate sector. Uh, a couple of years later, started a different process, which has been described particularly by Tom Ferguson, who's going to be here uh, Monday. He probably will talk about it, so I won't much. But uh, 
uh, the uh, parties be dissolved, essentially. It, it used to be that if you wanted a, uh, if a person in Congress uh, uh, hoped for a position of, uh, let's say, a committee chair or something, some position of responsibility, you got it mainly through seniority and service. Uh, within a couple of years, you started having to put money into the party coffers in order to get ahead. That just drove the whole system even deeper into the pockets of the corporate sector, increasing the financial sector. A tremendous concentration of wealth, uh, mainly in the, literally the top one-tenth of one percent of the population. Meanwhile, for the general population, it began and opened a period of uh, pretty much stagnation or even decline for the majority. Uh, people got by, but by uh, pretty artificial means, uh, borrowing, so a lot of debt, a uh, uh, no longer working hours, but pretty soon much higher than in other industrial countries, even past Japan, long past Europe. Uh, can't hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Still, how about that? So there was a period of stagnation and decline for the majority that continued alongside a very sharp concentration of wealth. Uh, the political system began to dissolve. Now, there's always been a gap between public policy and uh, uh, the public will, but it just grew kind of astronomically. Now, you can see it right now, in fact, the, uh, the big... The, can't hear me? I don't know what to do about it. These things are in my mouth. <laughs> and they don't taste good. The, uh, I'll just keep going. You can make it up. It's on the live stream. What? It's recorded on oh, okay. the live stream. Uh, let's take a look at what's... Get it on YouTube. Get it on YouTube. Okay. Uh, just take a look at what's happening right now. The, uh, the big topic in Washington everyone concentrates on is the deficit. Uh, for the public, correctly, the deficit is not regarded as much of an issue, and it isn't really much of an issue. Now, the issue is joblessness, not a deficit. Now, there's a deficit commission, but there's no joblessness commission. Uh, as far as the deficit is concerned, you want to pay attention to it. The public has opinions. Uh, take a look at the polls, uh, overwhelmingly support uh, higher taxes on the wealthy, which have declined sharply during this uh, stagnation period, period of decline. Uh, higher taxes on the wealthy and preserve the limited social benefits. Uh, the outcome of the deficit commission is probably going to be the opposite. Uh, either they'll reach an agreement which will be the opposite of what the public wants, or else it goes into a, a kind of a, a automatic uh, procedure which is going to have those effects. Actually, that's something that has to be done very quickly. Deficit Commission is going to come up with its decision in a couple of weeks. Uh, the Occupy movements could provide a mass base for trying to avert what... Uh, amounts to a dagger pointed at the heart of the country. It could have very negative effects. It's an immediate task. Well, without going on the details, what's being played out for the last 30 years is actually a kind of a nightmare that was anticipated by the classical economists. Uh, you take, say, Adam Smith, who bothered to read Wealth of Nations. Uh, he considered the possibility that... Uh, the merchants and manufacturers in England might decide to do their business abroad, invest abroad, and import from abroad. He said they would profit, but England would be harmed. Uh, however, he went on to say that they would prefer to, uh, the merchants manufacturers would prefer to operate in their own country, what's sometimes called a home bias. So as if by an invisible hand, uh, England would be saved the uh, ravages of what's now called neoliberal globalization. That's a pretty hard passage to miss uh, in his classic Wealth of Nations. That's the only occurrence of the phrase invisible hand. Maybe uh, England would be saved from neoliberal globalization by an invisible hand. His uh, 
the, the other great classical economist, David Ricardo, uh, recognized the same thing and hoped that it wouldn't happen, kind of a sentimental hope. And it didn't for a long time, but now it's happening. The last 30 years, that's exactly what's been underway. For the general population, you know, the 99% in the imagery of the Occupy movements, it's, uh, it's been pretty harsh, and it could get worse. And this could be a period of irreversible decline. Uh, for the 1%, even more, one-tenth of 1%, it's just fine. Uh, they're uh, you know, at the top of the, the, the richer than ever, uh, uh, more powerful than ever, controlling the political system, disregarding the public. Uh, and uh, uh, if it can continue, sure, why not? Just what Smith and Ricardo warned about. Uh, so, for example, take, say, Citigroup, uh, one of the most, for decades, one of the most uh, corrupt of the major kind of... In, investment banking corporations repeatedly bailed out by the taxpayer over and over again starting in the early Reagan years. Now, once again I won't run through the corruption. You probably know about it but it's pretty astonishing. A couple of years ago they came out with a brochure for investors. They urged investors to put their money in what they call the Plutonomy Index. They said the country, the world is dividing into a plutonomy, you know, the rich, the those who buy luxury goods and so on, and that's where the action is. They said their plutonomy index is way outperforming the stock market, so put your money into it. And as for the rest, we, we set them adrift. Uh, we don't really care about them. We don't need them. Uh, they have to be around to provide a powerful state which will protect us and bail us out when we get into trouble, but other than that they essentially have no function. And they're sometimes called these days the precariat, uh, people who live a precarious existence at the periphery of society. It's not the periphery anymore, it's becoming a very substantial part of uh, the society in the United States and indeed elsewhere. Uh, and uh, this is considered a good thing. So, for example, Alan Greenspan, at the time when you know, the competition, when Alan Greenspan was still, you know, St. Alan, uh, hailed by the economics profession as one of the greatest economists of all time, this was before the crash that, for which he was substantially responsible, uh, he was testifying to Congress in the Clinton years explaining the wonders of the great economy that he was supervising. And he said a lot of the, uh, the success of this economy, he said, is based on substantially on what he called growing worker insecurity. Can you announce that they need to stay off of the grassed, uh, roped-in areas? Please, please stay... Let's do it this way. Please stay off of the roped-in grass area over there. Uh, that's a very nicely done organic area, and we're trying to keep it clean. You heard him, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, um, Greenspan, uh, Greenspan testified that the uh, very successful economy he was uh, supervising, which has the properties I described, was based substantially on growing worker insecurity. If working people are insecure, if they're part of what we now call the precariat, living precarious existences, they're not going to make demands, they're not going to try to get wages, they won't get benefits, uh, we can kick them out if we don't like them. And that's good for the health of the economy. Uh, that's what's called a healthy economy, technically. And he was very highly praised for this, greatly admired. Well, now the world is indeed splitting into a plutonomy and a precariat. Uh, uh, again, in the imagery of the Occupy movements, uh, the 1% and the 99%, you know, not literal numbers, but the right picture. And uh, the plutonomy is where the action is. Well, it could continue like this. And if it does continue, this uh, historic reversal that began in the 1970s could become irreversible. Uh, that's where we're heading. And the Occupy movements are uh, 
you know, the first real major reaction, popular reaction, which could avert this. Uh, but as I said, it's going to be necessary to face the fact that it's a long, hard struggle. You don't win victories tomorrow. You uh, have to go on. You have to form structures that will be sustained. They'll go on through hard times and can win major victories. Now, there are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, I mentioned before the... Uh, you give me one of those mics so people can hear you better. Sorry. Just keep the... You just keep that one up to you. Uh, okay. I'll yeah. keep this. Uh, I mentioned before that in the 1930s, one of the most effective actions was uh, a sit-down strike. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, and the reason is very simple. That's just a step before takeover of the industry. Well, through the 70s, as the decline was setting in, uh, there were some very important events that took place. One was in the late 70s, uh, 1977. The U.S. Steel uh, decided to close one of its major facilities, Youngstown, Ohio, and instead of just walking away, the workforce uh, and the community uh, decided to get together and uh, uh, buy it from U.S. Steel and hand it over to the workforce to run and turn it into a worker-owned, worker-management uh, 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 facility. They didn't win, but uh, with enough popular support, they could have won. And it was a partial victory. It was a topic that uh, Igor Alperovitz particularly has discussed in detail. It was a partial victory because even though they lost, it set off uh, other efforts and now throughout Ohio, and in fact in other places, there's a, a scattering of hundreds, maybe thousands, of sometimes not so small uh, worker-owned, or at least partially worker-owned industries, uh, which could become worker-managed. And that's the basis for a real revolution. Uh, that's how it takes place. It's happening here, too. Uh, just in one of the suburbs of Boston about a year ago, Something similar happened. A, a multinational uh, decided to close down a, a profitable, functioning uh, uh, manufacturing facility. It was doing some high-tech manufacturing. Not profitable enough for them. The workforce and the union offered to buy it and take it over and run it themselves. And the multinational decided to close it down instead, probably for reasons of class consciousness. I don't think they want things like this to happen. Uh, if there had been enough popular support, if there had been something like this movement and it could have gotten involved, they might have succeeded. And there are other things going on like that. In fact, some of them are major. So not long ago, uh, Obama took over the auto industry. It's basically owned by the public. And there were a number of things that could have been done. Uh, one was what was done. It reconstituted so that it can be handed back to the ownership or very similar ownership and continue on its uh, traditional path. Uh, the other possibility was to hand it, up, hand it over to the workforce, which owned it anyway, uh, and turn it into worker-owned, worker-managed, major industrial system. That's a big part of the economy. And have it produce things that people need. And there's a lot that we need. Uh, we all know or should know that the U.S. is extremely backward globally in uh, uh, high-tech and uh, uh, high-speed transportation. It's very, it's very serious. It not only affects people's lives, it affects the economy. It's uh, a very serious business. Just had a personal story. I happened to be giving talks in France a couple months ago and ended up in southern France and had to take a train from Avignon, southern, southern France, but to the De Gaulle Airport in Paris, and it took two hours. It's the same distance as Washington to Boston. I don't know if you've taken that train, but it's about what it was, you know, 60 years ago when my wife and I first took it. And it's, it's, it's a scandal, you know. But it could be done. They had the capacity to do it, the skilled workforce. Uh, would have taken a little support, a popular support, and that could have made a major change in the economy. And just to make it more surreal, while this option was being avoided, uh, the Obama administration was sending its uh, 
transportation secretary to Spain to get contracts for developing high-speed rail for the United States, which could have been done right in the Rust Belt, which is being closed down. There's no economic reasons why this can't happen. These are class reasons and reflect the lack of popular political mobilization. Well, things like this uh, continue. Um, we have... Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. You can see why I'm not a public speaker. Well, this doesn't mean... <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'll just... Uh, like that? A little, little late, but uh, well, I, I think I've probably talked enough anyway, so let me just say that, uh, and I'd like to make more sense to turn this over to public discussion, but I kept to domestic issues, and these are by no means the only ones, you all know that. Uh, there's very dangerous developments uh, in the international arena, uh, including two of them, which are kind of a shadow that hangs over almost everything we discuss. Uh, there are, for the first time in human history, uh, real threats to decent survival of the species. Uh, there are two. The one has been hanging around for since 1945. It's kind of a miracle of escape. But, uh, that's the threat of nuclear, nuclear war, nuclear weapons. And though it isn't being much discussed, that threat is in fact being escalated by policies of this administration and its allies. And that something has to be done about that or we're in real trouble. Uh, the other, of course, is environmental catastrophe. Uh, the world is, practically every country in the world is taking at least halting steps towards trying to do something about it. The U.S. is also taking steps, namely to accelerate the threat. The U.S. is the only country, major country, that's not only not doing something constructive, but is you know, so it's not climbing on the train, it's pulling it backwards. Uh, Congress right now is uh, dismantling legislation uh, instituted by the Nixon administration, really the last liberal president in the United States, <laughs> literally. Uh, and it shows you what's been going on. They're dismantling the limited measures of the Nixon administration to try to do something about what's a growing, emerging catastrophe. And this is connected with a huge propaganda system perfectly openly declared by the business world to try to convince people that it's all just a liberal hoax. Why pay attention to these scientists? And we're really regressing back to the medieval period. It's not a joke. Now, if that's happening in the most powerful, richest country in history, this catastrophe isn't going to be averted. And uh, uh, everything else we're talking about won't matter in a generation or two. Well, all that's going on right now. Something has to be done about it very soon, very uh, in a dedicated, sustained way. It's going to be. It's not going to be easy to proceed. There are going to be barriers, difficulties, hardships, failures. It's inevitable. Uh, but unless the process that's taking place here, elsewhere in the country and around the world, unless that continues to grow and uh, uh, becomes a kind of a major force in the social and political world, the chances for a decent future are not very high. just a few questions right now. It's a little hard to see. I guess, why don't we take... Oh, hold on, we're... Um, I just called on this person. I, I think if I'm doing it, I'll do it, and I'll call you next. As far as fixing... As far as fixing the political dysfunction in this country... When I have heard it mentioned in various places, I've heard it mentioned here as having a constitutional convention or a constitutional amendment to uh, to abolish corporate personhood or to uh, or to, uh, yeah, money, yeah. to get corporate money out of, out of that context. So hold on just a sec. He's talking about 
corporate personhood and getting the money out of that stream in politics? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, these are very good things to do, but uh, you can't do this or anything else unless there's a large, active, popular base. Uh, most, the, the, if the Occupy movement was you know, the leading force in the country, you could push this forward. But remember, uh, m most people don't know that this is happening. Um, they may know about it, but not know what it is. And among those who do know, polls show that there's, there's a lot of support. But that uh, assigns a task. It's necessary to get out into the country and get people to understand what this is about and what they can do about it and what the consequences are of not doing about it, uh, not doing anything about it. And corporate poor personhood is an important case in point, but pay attention to what it is. We should think about it. Now, if you read the, you know, we're supposed to worship the Constitution these days, now, the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution says that no person shall be deprived of rights without due process you know, of law. Well, the Founding Fathers didn't mean, by person, they didn't mean person. So, for example, there were a lot of creatures of flesh and blood who weren't persons. The indigenous population, for example, they didn't have any rights. Now, there was a category of creatures called three-fifths human in the Constitution slave population. Now, they weren't persons. Uh, and in fact, w women women were barely persons, so they didn't have rights. Well, a lot of this was somewhat rectified over the years. They've, during the Civil War, the 14th Amendment raised the three-fifths humans to full humans, at least in principle. That, that was only in principle. I won't go through what happened next, but at least in principle. Now, if you come to, to uh, over the following years, the concept of person was changed by the courts in two ways. One way was to broaden it to include corporations, uh, legal fictions established and sustained by the state. In fact, the, these persons later became the management of corporations, according to the court decisions. So the management of corporations, they became persons. Of course, that's not what... No, not what the 14th Amendment says. It was also narrowed uh, to uh, undocumented uh, uh, immigrants. They had to be excluded from the category of persons. And that's happening right now. So the legislations that you're talking about, uh, they go two ways. They broaden the category of persons to include corporate persons, which by now have rights way beyond human beings, given by the trade agreements and others, and they exclude uh, the people who flee from uh, you know, Central America, where the U.S. devastated their homelands, free from Mexico, because they can't, uh, uh, they can't compete with the uh, uh, U.S., uh, say, uh, highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness. Uh, uh, remember, when NAFTA was passed, in 1994, the Clinton administration understood pretty well that it was going to devastate the Mexican economy. And that's the year when they started militarizing the border. Well, okay, now we're getting the consequences, uh, and uh, these people have to be excluded from the category of persons. So when you talk about personhood, that's right, but there's more than one aspect to it, and it ought to be pushed forward, and all ought to be understood and acted upon, but that requires a mass base. It requires that the population understands this and is committed to it. So it's, it's easy to think of a lot of things that should be done, but they all have a prerequisite, namely a mass popular base is there which is committed to implementing them. And we have a question about the ruling class in America. How likely is it that they will have an open fascist system here? I think it's very unlikely, frankly. Uh, the, uh, they don't have the force. Uh, about a century ago, uh, in the freest countries in the world, Britain and the United States, the, uh, at that time, the, you know, the dominant classes uh, came to understand that they can't control the population by force any longer. 
too much freedom had been won by struggles like these. Uh, it, uh, so they and they re- realized it. I mean, it's self-conscious it's discussed in their literature, and they recognize they're going to have to shift tactics to control of attitudes and beliefs instead of just the cudgel. Um, you don't throw away the cudgel, but it's not uh, can't do what it used to do. You have to control attitudes and beliefs, and in fact, that's when the uh, public relations industry began began in the United States and England, the free countries where you had to have a major industry to uh, control beliefs and attitudes, to induce consumerism, induce passivity, uh, apathy, distraction, uh, all the things you know very well. And that's the way it's been going on. But, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a barrier, but it's a lot easier to overcome than, uh, you know, the torture and the... Uh, uh, you know the Gestapo, and I, I don't think they are anymore. And the, uh, the, the circumstances exist any longer for instituting anything like what we called fascism. <clears throat> Excellent. And John from the library would like to ask his question. And then I have a few notes here. If you stand up, I will pass a note card to you. And if you could write your question, I've got one question over here and one question over there headed towards me, but if you stand up, we'll try to fit in a few others. Sir, I have a two-part question that I've been waiting to ask you my whole life. Um, You mentioned earlier that sit-down protests were just precursors to uh, a takeover of industry. I'd ask a like, I would like to ask you if today you would advocate a general strike as an effective tactic moving forward and second, if would you ever, if asked, allow for your voice to relay the democratically chosen will of our nation? I'm not sure I understand. My voice wouldn't help. I can't even reach you. But <laughs> and besides, you don't want leaders. You want to do it yourself. Uh, not that I could be one. But we will need representation in the international table. We need representation, but you should pick it yourselves, and they should be recallable representatives, so you're not going to fall into some system of control and hierarchy. Uh, but it's this question of the general strike is like the others. You, can't, it's, you can think of it as a possible idea at a time when the population is ready for it. We can't, like, we can't sit here and declare a general strike, obviously. Uh, there has to be approval. Uh, agreement, willingness to take the risks to participate on the part of the large mass of the population. And that takes organization, education, uh, activism. Education doesn't mean just uh, you know, telling people what to believe. It means learning ourselves. Uh, there's a famous line of Karl Marx, which I'm sure you all know, that uh, the task is not just to understand the world, but to change it. And there's a variant of that, which also should be kept in mind. If you want to change the world in a constructive direction, you better try to understand it first. And understanding it doesn't mean listening to a talk, uh, reading a book, uh, although that's helpful sometimes. It means learning, and learning you learn through participation. You learn from others. You learn from the people you're trying to organize. Uh, and you have to gain the experience and understanding which will make it possible to uh, uh, maybe to implement ideas like that as a tactic. But there's a long way to go. That doesn't happen by a flick of a wrist. That happens by hard, long-term, dedicated work. And I think in many ways maybe the most exciting aspect of the Occupy movements uh, is just the uh, construction of these... uh, associations, uh, bonds, linkages, and others that are taking place all over the place, all over, whether it's a cooperative kitchen or something else. And out of that, if they can be sustained, can come and expand it to the large part of the population that doesn't even know what's going on. If that can happen, then you can raise questions about tactics like this, which could, could very well at some point be appropriate. 